This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. On the heels of a suicide bombing in Afghanistan Saturday, they killed 12 Americans, a Canadian, and four Afghans. And similar attack on Monday in Kandahar that killed three U.N. workers and two others. The Obama administration says it's launched a revised strategy to end the decade-long war in Afghanistan. According to a report in The Washington Post, elements of the strategy already underway include escalation of military pressure and the Haqqani network of insurgents. Along with an open door for the network and other Taliban groups to hold direct talks with the U.S. In other Afghan news, evidence has emerged the U.S. continued to transfer prisoners to Afghan prisons despite knowing of widespread torture there. Afghan and Western officials interviewed by The Washington Post confirmed the U.S. both transferred prisoners to torture-linked prisons and later visited them there for interrogation. To discuss Afghanistan, I recently sat down with Jonathan Steele, longtime correspondent for the British Guardian newspaper, who's reported from Afghanistan since 1981. Steele's new book, Ghosts of Afghanistan, The Haunted Battleground, tackles the myths that he says have made it nearly impossible for the U.S. to construct a sensible strategy in the country or help build a viable Afghan state after three decades of war and foreign intervention. I began by asking Jonathan Steele about recently disclosed U.N. investigation that uncovered, quote, the systematic torture of prisoners by Afghan forces. In the U.S. either knew, and I'm pretty sure they did know, or they deliberately didn't want to know, they turned a blind eye to it, because they're funding uh, these ministries and the prison system of Afghanistan, allegedly, in order to try and reform them. And they were turning a blind eye to these incredible abuses that were going on there. Um, I wanted to play a clip. Uh, as the media takes us on and says, this is an outrage that we're funding a security force in Afghanistan that tortures people of a prisoner who was a prisoner in U.S. hands, um, Mozambique. You know him because he um, he lived in Britain. Uh, this is a comment of Mozambique, the British citizen who was born in Birmingham. Um, we, in February of 2002, he was seized by the CIA in Islamabad then held at Guantanamo. Um, Democracy Now! went to London to see him five years later, when he was released back to Britain. He talked about his experience. So that when I was eventually given into American custody and taken over to, Bagra to, to Kandahar, uh, the treatment that I received through the processing was probably the most de dehumanizing process, I think, that uh, um, anybody has ever endured in recent times, which included having uh, soldiers sit on me and then many other detainees, um, several of them pushing down on my head and my legs and my back, ripping over my clothes with a knife which I could feel slicing um, the cold blade against the back of my legs and back, uh, and then photographs being taken of me naked, being shackled, being spat at, photographs of me uh, um, shaven and unshaven, um, photographs of uh, soldiers abusing uh, me and other detainees, um, and derisive remarks about being a terrorist, being a murderer, being Muslim scum, things like this, dogs barking, and then eventually being taken over to um, an FBI uh, agent who looked rather strange with his FBI cap on, um, while I'm shivering there in, in, the na in naked, uh, and him asking me, when was the last time I saw Mullah Omar, when was the last time I saw Osama bin Laden? Uh, which was a standard question they asked of every detainee. That was Mozambique, who was held for years by the U.S. military. He was describing his experience when he was brought to Kandahar, then he was brought to Guantanamo, held for years, never charged, and ultimately released, now resides back in Britain. Jonathan Steele, as I listen to the pundits today uh, asking this question, how could we support Afghanistan? What have they learned? Why don't they—why uh, Why haven't they learned from our training? It sounds like that's exactly what they've learned from exactly. our training. Exactly. I think it's really good that you've shown that uh, interview, because it, uh, they're learning from Guantanamo. Guantanamo preceded all this abuse that we're now hearing about. So uh, it's been a two-way street. It's not a question of the Afghans doing this on their own. Um, let's talk about uh, what is happening today in Afghanistan. You have covered it for 30 years. What should we understand today about what is happening there? 
Well, two days after 9-11, <clears throat> I wrote a column in The Guardian saying that if the U.S. reaction was to put boots on the ground in Afghanistan and try to occupy that country and achieve, bring about regime change, they would suffer exactly the same fate as the Soviet Union. And I'm afraid to say that I've been proved right on that, because they're following exactly the same techniques as the Russians. It's what I call the garrison strategy. You hold the main cities, you try and keep the roads going open between them, and you make little forays into the countryside and try and push out a bit. But it doesn't work, because the, you create new resistance by being there. The resistance comes because you're there. You're not there because of the resistance. The Occupy, Occupy force itself creates the resistance. And so the crucial thing now is to recognize that the war is unwinnable. It is a stalemate. There is no military victory. And this is the lesson that I'm afraid President Obama hasn't yet learned from what the Soviets did, because Mikhail Gorbachev came into power in the Kremlin in 1985. After five years of war, where 9,000 Soviet soldiers had already died, he inherited somebody else's war from his predecessor. And he realized immediately that the war was unwinnable. He consulted his military. They also said the war is unwinnable. They didn't say, we want a surge. They didn't say, we want new troops, new equipment, um, you know, more scope, more money. They recognized that the thing was a disaster. Obama hasn't yet recognized that. And in fact, it's worse than that, because people like General Petraeus are still convinced that there can be a military victory. He has the ear of the president. He's the head of the CIA sees him virtually every day. And so it's, it's really important, I think, that the American public, and we know from the polls that more than half are against this war, really make their, their voice heard. I wanted to turn to the former head of U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal. Speaking at the Council on Foreign Relations earlier this month, McChrystal said the U.S. invaded Afghanistan with what he called a frighteningly simplistic understanding of the country that continues to this day. We didn't know enough, and we still don't know enough. Most of us, me included, uh, had a very superficial understanding of the situation and history, and we had a, a frighteningly uh, simplistic view of recent history, the last 50 years, the personalities, the actions that occurred. Many people thought, well, they fought the Soviets, they defeated the Soviets, and then there was this Taliban period, and then we came in 2001. But there were so many forces at play and so many personalities in the seven different Mujahideen groups, so many different actions that complicated that when we arrived, I think we were woefully underinformed. That was General Stanley McChrystal. Jonathan Steele. Well, it's an amazing admission. I mean, I think he speaks for everybody in the administration. He's at least had the honesty to say that. I mean, the people who took this decision to go to war, it was very similar to Iraq, in fact. It was done out of uh, uh, complete ignorance, without any real thinking about what happens on day two. First, you uh, topple the regime. Then what do you do? You, you end up occupying the country, trying this nation-building, and uh, resistance grows, and eventually uh, you're forced to, to withdraw.